Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That sounded a little uh, soft on my part, and your response matched that softness. And perhaps as we look around at the world, we wonder if Jesus is the King, why all this suffering? Why are there Christians who are being persecuted and Why are there marriages that are falling apart, and why are there sicknesses? Why are the governments so messed up? Why is my life not going better? If Jesus is really, as we discovered in Revelation 19, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, then why can't I get my locker open, if you want to use a title of a book that was popular when I was younger? Why is this world so broken? And I think the disciples asked that same question and they looked to Jesus as the great solution to earth's problems. And he is. And John the Baptist was struggling. He was in prison and wondering. He had seen the dove descend. He had heard the voice from heaven declaring that Jesus was the beloved son whom God the Father loved, and yet nothing was going as he thought it should. Life was still messy. The earth was still broken. Could this really be the Messiah? Sometimes we use the words, Jesus is king, a good and gracious king, and we know it and we believe it, but then we compare it to what we're experiencing or the earthquakes or the shattered lives around us or things that just don't make sense. And this week I was introduced to a number of those as I interacted with some of you where you say, well, if Jesus is king, why the suffering? Why the hurt? Why the devastation? Why... Do police officers get shot in domestic situations? And thankfully, the Bible has an answer for us. And if you have your Bibles with you this morning, and I hope that you do, if you could open them with me to Revelation chapter 20. Now, some, as they come to this chapter, say it is the most debated chapter in the whole book of Revelation. Perhaps, although for me, it's Relatively simple, I think we read it as it is written in the context of apocalyptic literature and it's talking about a coming king, a coming reign, a coming celebration in terms of a kingdom where Jesus is the supreme hands-on ruler and the enemy is vanquished, jailed. And I think why this is important in terms of the order of the book of Revelation is we've seen the return of Jesus and then this thousand-year reign that is coming. And so we know as we await this return that there is a war that is going on, a battle, and we're, we're shared in terms of biblical understanding or worldview that this is a fight that is intense. We're, we're fighting our own flesh. If you don't experience this and are not humbled by it, then you don't understand the holiness of God and the call on your life as one who is saved to be holy. We have a battle in terms of our own selfishness. I fight this every morning when I wake up and want my own agenda instead of the call to serve my family and this church and to follow God fully. We're at war with our flesh and we're to put to death, Romans 8 verse 13, the deeds of the flesh. We're at war with the world. We're strangers and aliens. We're to abstain from fleshly desires at war against the soul. This is 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. And live such good lives in the world, but not of the world, that others notice the holiness of God and the love of God and want to know the reason for the hope we have in Him and glorify Him with us. We need to hear that we will have trouble, John chapter 14, in this world, but take heart, He has overcome the world. We see a battle in Galatians 5 to walk in the spirit or to live according to the flesh and we're to live and walk in the spirit and put to death the deeds of the flesh. And then we find in Ephesians 6 and so many other places, there's actually a battle going on with the demonic realm. And sometimes living on earth is hard. In fact, I might say If we understand the intensity of the battle with the flesh, the devil, and the world, it is hard to live for the King of Kings 
and the Lord of Lords. And Revelation is written to these seven churches and to us to help them in the midst of this battle, the battle with the flesh, first love devotion, the battle with the world, the persecution that was overwhelming to these churches, the battle with the demonic realm as the intensity heats up to live with hope, to live with devotion, to be ready for the return of Jesus, to to have an understanding of the world that fits with what God has revealed and then to live in light of that revelation for the glory of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so when we declare Jesus is King, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, it's in the context of what he has revealed. In the context of the kingdom that has come, the rule of Christ that has come, but also the kingdom that is to come. So I want to read with you Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 10. I'll introduce you a little bit to the fight that is going on in the greater Christian world. And then we'll just work through the text to try to understand how we can apply it now. If you disagree with my take on this, I happen to be a, and I think I've shared this with you, a futurist. I'm in pre-mill. I understand this to be something from God to show us what is coming. The implications, the application becomes very similar if you're an on-mill. If you're a post-mill, the application is different. You're, you know, explain this a little bit more, but you're actually pursuing the kingdom now. You're fighting politically. You're fighting in all sorts of different ways. We've, we've seen this really rise up again post-COVID with the whole Dominion theology guys coming mostly out of Ontario, but we have them here as well. Many in the States who are trying to bring the kingdom now in terms of somehow take over the government, the religious right, Probably if you're post-mill, I don't think there'll be a lot of them here. Certainly post the First World War, most of that theologically has disappeared. Then the implications of the text remain very, very similar. So let's read the text. I'll try to explain that a little bit more, and then we'll preach through it. So a little Bible college course here, small, and then the text itself. And then obviously the most important is we hold up the Word of God to our lives as a mirror. It's applying it. It's living with hope in the midst of a broken world and surrendering all to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent that is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer. Notice again, who the devil is, who Satan is. He's an accuser of the brethren. He is the deceiver, the disorienter, the one who wants us to live like the world. Until the thousand years were ended, after that he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image or had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. Again, remember when we talked about this, I think they are literal marks, but they're also figurative or a picture of that loyalty to the world system with our minds and a serving of the world's systems with our lives. Maybe most clearly marked in Revelation with sexual morality and with materialism. These weren't worshiping the beast. These weren't marked by the world's ways. And they were martyred because of it. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until after the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ. And they will reign with him for a thousand years. Thousand years. Thousand years. Six times in this text it's repeated. And again... Here is where much of the debate happens. What is this thousand years? Really, there are three major schools of thought over the history of the church. The most historic, pre-mill, which is the one that I take. It's certainly the first 300 years or so of the church, the predominant view. And that's the view that Jesus' return is then followed by this thousand-year reign of Jesus. Christ will reign at this time And he will be the one who is sovereign over and literally here present in terms of his presence on earth. 
Then there's the post-mill perspective. I shared that this became really popular, I suppose, 100, 150 years ago, although has been found throughout the history of the church. It's that Christ's second coming is after the millennium. And our goal as Christians now is to bring politically and in any other way possible the rule of Jesus to this earth that we might somehow usher in then the return of Jesus. We preach the gospel, but it's more than that. We get involved in politics. We march. We shout. We revolt. There becomes an entire passionate pursuit of the world getting better and better and better because of Christians in the world. I know you will say that that's not happening. Anyone can obviously see that. I would agree with you. But there was this great idea that education and this equality that would come, certainly when all sorts of things, the Industrial Revolution and on, happened. People read that into the text. And then that's come back now with the whole religious right movement or a significant portion of it, dominion theology, this idea that if we march, if we protest, if we, if we get the right president or the right prime minister or the right politics, somehow we will have victory and we will usher in what is to come. That, that falls in line with this whole dominion theology or post-mill. Not a lot of that in my little world, in the greater Canadian world, we are seeing a resurgence of this especially in those who are getting more politically active. Pre-mill, post-mill, and then there's ah-mill. Really, the majority of modern scholars would take this, although most of my friends are pre-mill. There's a mix between pre-mill and ah-mill. This is the idea that really it's figurative. There will be uh, no literal historical reign of Christ on earth for a thousand years. Uh, His second coming really then ushers in the eternal state. There's all sorts of nuances to this in terms of Israel, Israel being a part of God's plan from eternity past into eternity future, or the church replacing Israel. The Amils would say that the church fulfills all of the promises to Israel. pre mill says there's still a plan from God for the people of Israel. All right, there's enough of your Bible college for now. You'll hear me as I preach this that I happen to be one who takes us literally. I am a pre-mill, pre-trib, pre-wrath person. I understand this to be something that happens in history where this literally occurs. Again, I would say to you, whether you do or not, what I want you to notice is the application or implications of this remain consistent unless you're into the dominion theology, the the violent takeover of the world through your political activism and your gospel sharing. I want us to notice three things from this text in terms of what the millennial kingdom will look like. And I'll try to help you understand, I'll I'll ignore post-mill for now, I'll try to help you understand how the ah-mill take it, although some of you who are ah-mill might come up and try to correct me afterwards, and I would not welcome that, so... Uh, The first thing you'll notice is in this text, Satan will be bound. Now for me, I take this literally. There's actually going to be a time, a thousand year time, where the demonic realm, Satan and his demons, will be sent into a captivity where they cannot deceive the world any longer. An all-male person would say they're already bound a little bit by the gospel, but there's still a battle that's going on. I, I read this as absolute. So in the millennial kingdom, Satan will not be able to influence people. The battle with the demonic realm that marks this current age so intensely, although sometimes in North America we try to ignore it, this battle will cease to be a battle. The victory will have been won, although we'll notice that he will be released. The demonic realm will be released right at the end of the thousand-year reign. But, But for now, what we can hope for in terms of our own implication of this is... There is a time where this battle that is so intense, and I would include here the battle with the flesh, the world, and the devil, will cease in terms of the demonic realms, accusations and deceptions. I want the implication of this, and so you're going to see in terms of how I share this with you to be that in the battle now, we battle with hope, but we battle with intensity. There is a spiritual war that's going on, and that spiritual war includes your interactions, your pursuit of holiness, the desire you have to have a worldview that honors Jesus, what you watch, what you do, how you live, how you treat your neighbors, how you interact with one another. There is a spiritual battle that is going on. It includes how you feel and when you wake up and you're overwhelmed with your own sin and you can feel those accusations coming at you and 
I could include all sorts of other realities, and we need to learn, and this is the implication of this, in the millennial kingdom, we won't have this battle. Now we will. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Here here is what it's saying. There's a battle going on that we're intensely involved in. That battle will end and the angel will come in the power of God and with a key, with that strength, put the demonic realm away and they will be held captive in prison for a thousand years. But until then, the battle is raging and we must fight. Fight by taking captive every thought. Making it obedient to Christ. Fight so that our hearts are responding and our delights are those that the word of God desires and If you look around, what you will discover is in North America, we are struggling with this. When I teach this at seminary, one of the things that I try to work through with the students, and it is not easy, some are missionaries in other fields, because we tend to see spiritual warfare as that demonic that's so easy to see, the vile evilness of it, or the power of people who are possessed. And yes, I agree, that is all real, and that is all something we should be aware of, but it is so small in comparison to what the Bible teaches true spiritual warfare is. It's a battle for our minds, what we value, what we treasure. We need to learn this, or we will ignore the spiritual battle and Just think it's something that happens on the mission field and oh, that we would wake up and realize Canada is now a mission field. And the battle is now intense. Was visiting with one of my fellow pastors in the area and we were just talking about, well, how many many authentic Christians are there? And he gave a number that was pretty low, almost as low as Newfoundland as we talk about going there. And then we started talking back and forth and I thought it was a little bit higher. And then he said, of those who go to church, he shrunk it even more. And I think sometimes we're, we're losing this battle because we spend so much time in the world and not by the Spirit engaging in this battle that is going on. This millennial promise is there is a time coming where there will be absolute peace, absolute justice. Jesus will be here in person physically reigning through the saints. But until then, the battle is intense and it's with the demonic realm. Listen to Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And then we're called to put on spiritual armor. And as you walk through that spiritual armor, it's Let me just simply say this. It's not something you do every day. It's something you do once and you put on. And then, obviously, in terms of the sword and the prayers, they're, they're consistent. But everything else is this put it on and leave it on. And it's just the simplicity of a gospel oriented life. Living in the reality of who God is and what God has done, especially in the reality of the gospel. And we fight in God's strength to control our minds and to shape our hearts and to. Have our lives lived in such a way that we're displaying the beauty and glory of the goodness of who God is. Oh, you know this. If you're trying to please God, there is a war going on. And this passage reminds us of that war and the hope of the time where the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will end that war in one fell swoop. And it won't even be hard for him. So here's a reminder to the seven churches. It's a hope-filled reminder, but a reminder all the same. Stay strong. Fight forward. The victory is sure, but the battle intense. Is that not a good way to understand the entire book of Revelation? I was talking to someone this morning. They taped the Canucks game last night. I am one who is now hoping both the Flames and the Canucks lose out. So they get a chance at Connor Bedard. If you know hockey, you know what I'm saying. And I shared with him that the Canucks won, and he had taped the game, so I'm not sure he knew that yet. 
You know, there's always one in every crowd who likes to wreck those who are taping the game, right? That's me. I used to love more than I do now. Now I'm busy and I don't get to watch a lot of hockey. The boys do and we watch some. But, but I used to just get so involved in the games. And this was back when Edmonton was evil. And they always beat Calgary. And when I say always, I, I think that's actually accurate. And you'd be watching these games, and Calgary would be so close. And Calgary even sometimes won the President's Trophy, and it'd be so close. And I'd walk, and I'd, I'd get up. We were at Caremport, and I'd, I'd, we'd be at friends' places, and I would literally I couldn't sit to watch. It was just so intense. And I, I somehow knew in the back of my mind, we're going to lose. We're going to figure out how to lose, or Gretzky's going to beat us. And ah, oh, the intensity and anxiety. And ah, oh, if you're a hockey fan, you understand what if I knew the score, the final score, as I was watching? And I knew even though Calgary was down by eight, and even though there was no possible hope for them, that they ended up winning 10 to nine. If I knew that in the intensity of the battle that I was a part of in watching as a fan, I could rest and have peace from that anxiety, right? Even engaging, even as a fan cheering or being disappointed with poor plays, I would have a peace, perhaps even a renewed passion to engage if I knew the outcome. Now, we're not watchers, we're players. And sometimes it feels like we're, we're losing. Sometimes it feels like with Maid coming in and all the stuff going on with the LGBTQ and you start going on about marriages falling apart and the intensity of the attack on marriage and we can't even define what a woman is anymore, let alone value them the way God does. Sometimes in the intensity of the battle as a player, we can feel overwhelmed. We can feel like John the Baptist or the disciples and this is here to help us to carry on, to fight on, to engage and take captive every thought and to seek to be obedient to Jesus and to love one another and to be holy because there is a kingdom coming where he wins absolutely. And we get to be a part of that. We get to reign with him. There is no question about the outcome. Fight on. Fight on. Secondly, so he will be removed completely. Verses 1 to 4. There will be no spiritual battle left. Secondly, the saints will rule. There will be a time when all who hate God and all who are his enemies are removed. I suppose in some ways that causes us heartbreak now. And even, I hope, a renewed energy to evangelize. But those who reject God will disappear. And this text talks about that. Everyone left will be loyal to God and... Here, so precious, I quote one scholar, John sees the panorama of God's people resurrected, rewarded, and reigning with Christ. The glorified saints will perfectly carry out his will. I mean, can you imagine? The martyrs are given a very special place because of their loyalty to God. And if you know some, I have had the privilege of knowing some. We learn from them. God elevates them. There's a loyalty and a preciousness to standing so firm that you're persecuted for him, that, that you witness so strongly, that your witness is so sure that when, and, and maybe for you it's a loss of a job or a <clears throat> loss of friendship or one of those things for, for what's being talked about here, I think because it's coming now at the end of Revelation, it's talking about those who suffered so intensely. But here we find this perfect world. The world is restored. God's, God's perspective of what is best on earth is there for a thousand years. It's not the final judgment yet, but it's a place where Jesus is on the throne and where those who reject him and attack him are removed. All of the humans who were evil, all marked with the mark of the beast, all of the demonic realm removed. And here is earth as it could be and under the reign of Christ should be peace, justice, no sickness, perfect politicians, if you want to call the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords a politician. You see how incredible and miraculous this is? There is so much hope. 
And we will rule with him if we are counted as overcomers, if we have the mark of the Lamb, if we're those who are living ready when Jesus returns. Thirdly, Satan will be removed, saints will rule, Satan will be judged. I don't really understand why Satan is released here at the end. You see that at the end of this text. When the thousand years are ended, picking up in verse 7, Satan will be released from his prison. There's all sorts of ideas as to why this is. I think the best, although I'm saying to you now as one who loves God's word and studies hard, I, I don't fully understand this, but the best is the beauty and glory of the gospel is best seen against the blackness. If you think of the gospel as a diamond and you put it down on a, on a velvet that shows the greatness and beauty of that diamond, it's seen in terms of the blackness of sin. Some, some say to prove why it's just to punish Satan for eternity. I don't really know, but what we see is he is released, but there will be a judgment for him, and it will be intense. It shows us the heart of Satan, that he must and should be destroyed in hell for eternal conscious punishment. It also shows that even in our near-perfect environment, there can still be destruction of hearts that reject and attack God. The frailty of humans refocuses us on our need for grace and our dependence upon God, and that the only hope we have is Jesus. But I love this. Satan is doomed. Let me repeat that. Because if you understand the intensity of accusations, divisions, disorientations, confusion, self-hatred, being accused by the demonic, If you don't experience fully the freedom that is in Christ, the value you are to him, then then this becomes something to hope in. He will be punished. Listen to verse 10. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I sometimes struggle through understanding fully what conscious torment will be in terms of hell and what the Bible reveals about it. There's no question the Bible teaches that, but I will tell you that this verse, talking about it, gives me joy. Satan who comes, Satan who attacks, Satan whom we fight in the strength that God provides, this Satan will be judged and he will spend eternity in hell in conscious torment. All of the destruction that he has brought to our own lives, all of the sin that we've been tempted and then responded in our own wills to commit, all of those things will be punished for us in Christ, for him in eternity in hell. It's a good reminder for us of the end of Satan and the hope we have and also of the end of Satan's followers, which we'll get into next Sunday, God willing, Because we so long to be those who live in freedom, who live in his presence and surrender to him, his kingdom, meaning his reign now, choosing to follow him completely, anticipating this thousand year reign of Christ where it will be active and earth wide, but also for all eternity because we belong to Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So although this is sometimes confusing now, let me declare as loud as I can, Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Jesus is coming again. And Jesus will make everything right. And we, in the midst of the battle now, can fight with hope can fight knowing that the end is sure and when we feel like we're down by 10 and it's overwhelming and the anxiety is creeping up to know that we win not 10 to 9 or 11 to 10, but a billion to zero. Because Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So how do we... reply to this or apply it, I suppose, in our lives. And, and I think, again, if you're post-mill, it's a little more difficult, so let me just say you're on your own. If you're pre-mill or a-mill, the implications are very similar. 
Implication number one, be ready. Live ready. Jesus is coming again and he's coming to take us into his kingdom where we reign with him and death has no power over us. No pain, no brokenness on this earth can steal our hope if we understand this. So we live ready. Oh, Lord Jesus, would you come? I was talking to someone today who's a little bit sick, someone who lost their mother and others this week. This hope is sure. When Jesus comes either by death for us or his return before all, either way, live ready. Be prepared. How do you be prepared? The answer is twofold. You believe in Jesus. You accept what he has done for you on the cross. He becomes your Lord, your Savior, your King. And then as an overflow of that, you live for him. We're going to see as the text goes on that literally we're judged by our works, not meaning works save, but a faith that saves, changes us, transforms us. And now we're living for him, with him, anticipating this victory that is to come. Living ready means that we know him and are known by him and that relationship is the most important thing to us on this earth. When I talk to those who are struggling with dominion theology or post-mill, I suppose, is a historic word for it, my heart breaks because the world is going to get worse and worse. I don't know. Maybe God will send a renewal or revival. I hope so. I pray so. I hope these youth come back so fired up for Jesus that we feel in them and see in them this full devotion and it is infectious and we get it and there's a revival in Canada. Wouldn't that be amazing? But I also know if Revelation is true, and it is, and by the way, it's not new in Revelation, just read your entire New Testament, that this world is going to get worse. And the light we have from Jesus needs to shine brighter. And there will be martyrs, perhaps even in our own nation. And part of being ready is a radical Devotion to him. Two questions for you in terms of being ready. In terms of this implication of Revelation 20. Do you truly know him as Lord and Savior? Do you acknowledge from the inside out, certainly with your mind, but beyond that you're a sinner, you've fallen short of the glory of God, you compare yourself with him, and you, you just don't measure up. You, you read his word, and there are so many places where your life and the mirror of God's word don't line up, and you realize you can't be good enough to be saved. And So in hopelessness, in your own strength, you continue to read, and you discover that God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die in your place, to pay the penalty for sin on the cross and to rise again, conquering sin and death. And he's alive. And you can know him and be loved by him and live for him. Are you ready? Do you know him? Have you believed? For it's by grace you are saved through faith. Have you responded and chosen in his grace, he putting it in you, but you responsible to choose in his grace to say, yes, I believe. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead and I am saved. I am ready. And then to live ready means that you are fully devoted to him. I call this being worshipful, living in the hallelujah crowd. But it's more than just our responses on a Sunday morning. It's all of our lives. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, Romans 12, 1, offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual, logical act of worship. It's, it's saying, God, here I am. God, you place me in my community so that my neighbors can come to know you as Lord and Savior. God, you've, you've given me my family so that I can serve them and show them your great gospel. God, you've, you've placed me in my workplace or at my school because you have a plan to use me to accomplish your will. This is amazing, right? See, being ready means that now I'm living on mission for him. Not only holy, meaning set apart and pure, but also helping others to know Jesus. My life is his, driven and defined by that relationship. Be ready, be worshipful, and now a warning. 
be on guard. For although in the thousand year reign of Christ, which is literal and coming, there will be no spiritual battle that's going on for the devil and his forces will be in prison. There is a battle now. It's a battle for your hope. A battle for your heart. A battle to try to, if the demonic realm gets their way, divide and destroy and create incredible disorientation away from fixing our eyes on Jesus. How do we battle? Well, we've gone over this previously, but let me just give you two admonitions. Seek to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ, or I suppose, using different language, be word-saturated. Spend more time in the Word than in the world. That's not easy, especially with everything coming at us. But if you don't, then you might end up thinking like the world and not the Word and fall under the deceptive spell of the devil. Be on guard. Intake the Word of God. Study, memorize, listen to it, preach, take notes, apply it to your life. Hold it up as a mirror. Never lose sight of the greatness of God, the glory of the gospel, and the richness of His call to serve Him. Admission number one. Make sure your word's saturated. Take captive every thought if you want to use spiritual warfare language. Admission number two. Get your spiritual armor on. It's not some mystic thing that you pray on every day. I'm not opposed to those who read it every day, but it's not some mystic thing. It's choices you make. It's delighting in your salvation so that your mind is protected. It's, it's making sure that you have the truth of who God is and what he has done, and it's girding you up. It's making you ready to fight. It's, it's making sure the gospel of peace, peace for you, and peace that you offer is this in those hobs, knobs of your shoes so that you can stand firm in the midst of the blood and the gore that is on the battlefield. It's the shield of faith that allows you to stand firm when everything is not making sense and the fiery darts of the devil are coming at you so strong and they hit that shield and you say, no, I believe, I stand firm. God is real and relevant and with me and I fight on. See, it's not easy, but we win. And Revelation 20 is real and coming. So be encouraged. Be engaged. And let's live together for the glory of God. He is real. And he is relevant. And he is coming again. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word and the privilege of sharing with one another and encouraging one another. Oh, God, help us. Help us to anticipate your return, Lord Jesus, and with joy to live for you now. Help us to believe and to walk by faith and stand firm and fight together for your glory, our purity, and in a love, the displays we've experienced your love. Help us to be healthy holy, fully devoted followers of you. Help us to surrender and live in your kingdom now, even though it is not yet. And help us to anticipate with great joy the millennial kingdom. When, Lord Jesus, you will reign here. The devil will be bound. And we will reign with you. Thank you for your word and the hope it provides. Oh, would you offer that? in the power of your spirit, to any who are struggling, to those who in the brokenness of life feel like giving up, would we together fight on in this hope for the victory is sure. The kingdom is real. Your glory, amazing. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen.